Good morning, everyone, and welcome to AMSA's last webinar of this fiscal entitled Bridging Language Learning Assessment with the Real World. My name is Farah Kotadia, and I am AMSA's Program Director. We are also very happy to be celebrating International Women's Day today by showcasing the dedication of women to the field of settlement language supports and newcomer integration. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. We would also like to thank Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, or IRCC, for funding this event today. Today's webinar will consist of four presentations with question and answer periods in between. Our presenters are Julie Shipp, AMSA Settlement Language Coordinator, Jennifer Lowe, Instructional Coordinator and Link Teacher at Mosaic, Anita Price, Coordinator of ESL and Settlement Assistance Programs at Caribou Chilcotin Partners for Literacy. Anita will be joining us on the phone today from 100 Mile House. And our final presenter will be April Toe, a link instructor at Success. At the end of the webinar, we may have some time for a final Q&A, so please keep those questions coming. I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Julie Shipp, AMSA's, language, AMSA's Settlement and Language Coordinator, who will be framing the topic and giving us a preamble for today. Originally from the bilingual Nickel capital city of Sudbury, Ontario, Julie has a BA in English and Film from Laurentian University and a Bachelor of Education in French and English Language Education from the University of British Columbia. Julie is currently studying the culture and politics of second language learning and literacy and multimodality in a master's of education program at the University of British Columbia. As AMSA Settlement Language Coordinator, Julie facilitates the BC Settlement Language Working Group and is a member of the National Newcomer Language Advisory Body. She has taught languages at private institutions, school districts, and in LINK. She was part of Cohort 4 PBLA instructor training and completed Stage 2 implementation as well as the PBLA Practice Review Framework. To begin, Julie will provide a brief background on the language assessment or learning portfolio-based language assessment framework. Welcome, Julie. Thanks very much, Farah. And hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the webinar. So, PBLA was introduced in 2013-2014 to provide an alternative to traditional standardized externally developed testing practices. The goal was more teacher-led and classroom-based assessment for learning. Ongoing assessment in the classroom not only takes the pressure off learners to memorize and perform, but allows more opportunity for self-reflection and a more democratic growth-minded approach to the teaching and learning cycle. Feedback is more immediate and both the teacher and learner can adjust throughout the process to maximize learning. With this being said, it's also important we acknowledge that principles and frameworks are easier said and designed than implemented. It's for this reason that today we explore innovative ways that instructors are providing their language learners with opportunities to increase this learner-centered feedback loop, connect with community, and in the case of portfolio-based language assessment, increase Canadian language benchmark-aligned task-based artifacts that demonstrate the student learning. While this webinar is not a PBLA training, but rather a sharing of best practices, when listening to the presentations, it's important to keep in mind the differences between three important concepts. Number one, skill building activities in the classroom. Number two, skill using tasks that can be rehearsed or enacted in and out of the classroom setting. And three, assessment tasks, which can take place, <coughs> which take place in the classroom and are assessed by the instructor. As another reminder, skill building activities, which may include grammar and vocabulary development, cannot be used as PBLA assessment artifacts, 
but may be kept in language companions in the My Notes or other section. Also, the Emerging Practice Guidelines Part B Portfolio Contents page states that, quote, portfolios should contain a balance of skill using activities and assessment tasks, end quote. Note, however, that in order to avoid false assessments of learning, instructors should avoid duplicating skill using tasks as later assessment tasks. Learners should not have rehearsed the exact task they will be assessed on. So it is within this Part B guideline of balancing skill using and assessment tasks that instructors may choose to design skill using tasks that play, take place in community settings or tasks that prompt interactions with community organizations and the, their diverse demographics. Language learning and skill using that bridges with community is a way to make space for different Canadian perspectives, including those of Indigenous peoples, LGBTQ plus groups, world Englishes, and variations of French that may not always present themselves in classroom materials or within newcomer classroom demographics. Since the goal of IRCC funded instruction and assessment is to prepare learners to carry out language tasks successfully in their interactions beyond the classroom, our feature presenters will share some of their approaches to bridging real world language tasks with the real world. Great, thank you very much, Julie. I would now like to introduce our first guest speaker, Jennifer Lowe. Jennifer has been a link instructor at the Vancouver Mosaic Language Center for the last 12 years and has been an instructional developer for the last four. Jennifer has had the pleasure of teaching ESL to refugee claimants, international students, and to francophone children. In her current LINK class, Jen finds creative ways to plan meaningful classroom activities using minimal materials and maximizing tasks. As an instructional developer, she enjoys supporting and working alongside other stage two instructors as they navigate and adapt to the requirements of PBLA. I will now pass it over to Jen Lowe, welcome. Thank you so much, Far, for that very nice introduction. And thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Um, and a very, very happy International Women's Day to all of you. Um, I wanted to start off by briefly just talking about the organization that I work for, which is Mosaic. And Mosaic is a registered charity serving immigrant, newcomer, and refugee communities in the greater Vancouver area. And we just celebrated our 40th anniversary last year. Our mission is to empower newcomers to fully participate in Canadian society and we do that through advocacy and outreach, and we also do that through services and programs such as LINK. So at the Mosaic Language Center, I do have two roles, and that is as LINK instructor and as instructional developer, and I'll refer to myself as ID throughout this presentation. Um, as LINK instructor, since PBLA started, I've mostly been working with LINK 6 and I've also done some work with LINK 4. So what I've, I'm going to talk about today is a little bit more catered towards stage two, but definitely can be modified to adapt to all levels, hopefully. Um, as instructional developer, I provide a supervisory and support role to classroom instructors, predominantly in stage two. And as part of the ID team, we were responsible for the PBLA implementation rollout and we help the program to maintain PBLA best practices. So for today's webinar, um, what I'm gonna be talking about is managing PBLA in real world ways. Um, and that I'm gonna talk about that in four different ways. Um, how to collect portfolio artifacts through various methods, how to combine CLB competency areas when it makes sense, bringing real world experiences into the classroom, and developing means as a team to manage the PBLA workload. <clears throat> so as part of PBLA, we are required to have eight to 10 artifacts or that is documented tasks in a student's portfolio per skill, that's for reading, writing, listening, and speaking, prior to being able to issue a report card or prior to moving a student up. So one of the things that I find hardest um, as an instructor and um, 
to support with as an instructional developer is just, um, is just the documentation of the portfolio tasks. So I wanted to talk about flip side tasks. And this is something um, that I've dubbed because it's something that I've tried to do as much as I can um, in my class to make documenting tasks manageable. So in the real world, if I watch a movie or I read a book, I'm likely going to tell a friend about it. Um, if I learn how to make a recipe from a cookbook and it turns out really well, I'm going to teach a friend about it or a family member. Um, so tasks that we do in the real world have two sides and I try to um, bring this into my classroom. So for example, if I have a presentation from Service Canada on EI, I'll have students um, document that as a reproducing information, a competency to writing skill. And from those notes, I'll get them to tell some about it. Because basically when we, when we hear a presentation or watch a presentation, we often tell someone about it. So there are two tasks there right away. Um, one of the things that I did recently in my class was um, for the media and communications topic where students wanted to really know how to read and understand a newspaper article. So from that, um, the students did a reading comprehension task. Um, and then by paraphrasing and summarizing what they learned, they actually presented that information to small groups. Um, then those who listened to the presenters actually had to identify the main idea from that. And right there, there are three tasks that could be documented. Um, the reading comprehension, the presentation part of it, as well as the listening for gist and for um, main ideas. So by doing these flip side tasks, students really reinforce their understanding of a topic. Um, and most of the skill building is done up front. Um, for those of you who are a bit familiar with PBLA, this might even be considered a tight, a very, very tight module. So doing something like this does require very careful step by step instructions and careful planning. And it's really important to let the students know what the end goal is and, and how this benefits them in the real world. Um, Reading a newspaper is a very real world task, and I really feel that at stage two and up, newspaper stories are a great use of um, task based learning to connect students with what is happening in the real world and in the community. So I'm going to talk a little bit about self assessments and for that um, reading task, reading the newspaper task that I just mentioned earlier, that wouldn't be possible if everything was teacher directed and teacher marked. It's just a lot of work for an instructor to take care of. So I really advocate for the use of self assessments and peer assessments as well. So peer assessments and self assessments involve students in their own learning and assessment of progress. It really helps them to develop that autonomous learning or what we consider assessment as learning, um, which really does help students with their lifelong learning goals. Um, and so with this approach as well, it's not so much in test like conditions, which are being asked of us uh, for more formal assessments. Um, and it's just less teacher directed, um, which leaves the onus on the student to really develop their own skills and understanding of what they're doing. So um, this video was of a yoga teacher. So even though we can't take students out to a yoga class, we can actually bring it into the classroom. So the students were working on how to maintain their stress or with stress management. And so we had a video, an instructional video of a yoga teacher actually doing breathing exercises. And so the students use that um, for a comprehending instructions task. Um, and listening to an instructional video is very much something that someone would do in the real world as well. So I'm just going to talk about peer assessments next. Um, I really love peer assessments. And if you can see the feedback that's actually on the screen now, um, that's real feedback from my students. And, and it always just really amazes me um, at how well students can support each other in the classroom. So for me, giving constructive, giving constructive feedback is a real world skill. And students discuss the feedback with each other. They do that together as in the real world or as they would do perhaps on the job. Um, and this, again, can be included into the portfolio as a task. So one of the ways as instructional developers that we've tried to um, support uh, teachers with in, ter in terms of getting all of those tasks in and those um, artifacts into the portfolio is for them to collect anecdotal evidence and to me, anecdotal evidence is really as real world as it gets. This is proof of how students are making connections to the community. So we encourage students to share their successes with us outside of the classroom. 
how they actually use that task-based language they learned in the class in the real world. And they're often super proud to be able to share it with us as their instructors. So some of the ways that we do that is, um, is it maybe a student will tell us about getting help on the phone with a bill error, or tells us about a successful parent-teacher interview they had. They may tell us that they joined a volunteer program which requires emails and phone calls and interviews. And as you can see on the screen, this is a email, an email that a student had sent to me just letting me know that she was gonna be late. And that's something I printed out and put it into the writing section of my portfolio, or of her portfolio, I should say. The other way to collect anecdotal evidence is to notice ways that students use task-based language inside the classroom, outside of the actual task we're teaching them. And some examples of that would be um, if a student arrives late and another student gives them instructions on how to do that activity, or a student comes in and gives a, an excellent reason why they came in late. Um, sometimes students translate for other students as well. And so these are all things that can be documented on just a piece of paper. And, um, and here we have a skill using sticker that we use to just put on that, that memo and add that to their, to their portfolio binders. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna go a little more quickly. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is combining competencies. And um, in the real world, we have to combine competencies, we just do. And it just makes it easier if we have more than one on an assessment, and it's very real world to do so. So on the screen, you can see there is a parent-teacher interview, and this requires two skills. It requires um, social interaction, which is a competency one, as well as sharing information, which is a competency four. And so I, we encourage teachers to do this. Doing more than two um, makes too much criteria, but um, having two is just perfect and it makes perfect sense. Um, another example of, of combining competencies would be for searching information online, which would be a competency three, getting things done, as well as a competency four, comprehending information. So um, this is one way to cover all the competencies that we are required to do as part of PBLA under each skill. So in the classroom, teachers work to replicate real world experiences through tasks. I find that using students' own experiences for assessments as much as possible really ensures that it is real world for them. So with PBLA and all the documentation, it comes across as a quantitative approach, particularly when assessments are to be in test-like conditions. And I really believe that it should be more of a qualitative approach. Um, tasks are to build student success in the real world and not necessarily for content memorization. So whenever possible, when I do more formal assessments that are teacher directed, I actually leave a space on the assessment for students to write their own scenarios. Um, so students use their own personal experiences in an assessment. And this way, I really feel that they're more likely to use the language in the real world. So an example would be if the task is to describe symptoms to a doctor, instead of giving a student a random symptom card is actually saying, what kind of symptoms have you been experiencing? What's a reoccurring illness for you or for your child or for your parent? And for them to use that in the assessment. Um, same thing for a parent-teacher interview, um, for, the, for the student to actually bring up real concerns that they may have with their own child. Um, and the other thing that I find really fun in the classroom is to stage the classroom to emulate a real-world experience. So in my class, sometimes um, I will have like hotel front desks. I'll just arrange the classroom to have that, um, to sort of have re restaurant scenarios. Um, when we do interviews, I actually have the interviewees leave the classroom and have the interviewers stand up, greet them at the door, do that firm handshake, have them sit down. I find those things just add a lot of fun into PBLA. And also it gives the students a closer sense of what to expect in a real job interview. It's also really helpful for kinesthetic learners as well. So um, in terms of facilitating real world connections, I'll just talk really briefly about that. And I just wanted to say as the IDs or the instructional developers, we really do keep our ears and eyes out for free community real world connections. Um, whenever there are events where students can volunteer, we always suggest the higher level students to, to volunteer for those events. And we also organize field trips and guest speakers for the classes. Um, at Mosaic, we do have limited budget, only one set of bus tickets for a class per term. And we never ask students to pay for fees as some can't afford it. So helping them make these connections um, that are free and bringing in those guest speakers really helps with that. 
And lastly, I just wanted to leave with managing the workload and ways to support instructors. So um, with PBLA, it is just a lot of work and we do find that teachers are burning out. There's the creation of assessments, marking assessments, developing new materials that are task-based to match task-based curriculum, which the admin team has had to develop, portfolio maintenance and reviewing, getting in the baseline documents for new students. And at Mosaic, we have ongoing intake, so that's something to keep up with tracking progress, action-oriented feedback, goal setting, student reflections, <laughs> there's a lot. So at Mosaic, um, we have tried in many ways to really support our instructors with managing PBLA. And some of the ways that we've done that is to use those skill using stickers I showed earlier um, and to, to collect anecdotal evidence whenever possible as a task. Um, to mark receptive tasks in the class with the students, giving immediate feedback. And um, we've also actually started something called a sharing basket, um, which is a folder that is shared across sites where teachers can um, pull their resources together. And one of the things that has made that really successful is by actually giving teachers paid professional develop development time. We call them sharing sessions. And teachers meet with other teachers at their own sites and across sites and um, really help to build the resources together and share those resources together. Again, just to make everything more manageable. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to leave with, um, please listen to your team and respond to your team um, and make sure that all levels of management are aware of significant concerns. It's the teachers that are on the ground doing the work with the students. They're creating these real world connections to the community. So I think it's really important to listen to their input to make PBLA manageable so that they can continue their good work. Great, thank you very much, Jen. You're so for, <laughs> for those of you listening, please send us your questions if you have any questions for Jen using the GoToWebinar question box. Uh, you can also send us a question on Twitter or you can email them to communications at amsa.org. So Jen, um, one question is, you know, I, I really appreciate this concept of flip side tasks to reinforce skills. Mm -hmm. Could you share another example, perhaps other than newspaper reading, that you might use as flip side tasks? Absolutely. Um, I think the other example I gave just now was, um, was about the EI presentation. Um, so that really works often when there are presentations. I have students take notes just as we would. Um, when we go out, I don't know, like I will go to the library and watch a presentation and I'll take notes and then I'll share that with someone. Um, another one I did that I really enjoyed that I think is possible with higher levels is um, we were learning about language um, learning strategies as part of our education topic. And I actually had students take the various types of learning styles, so kinesthetic, read, write, etc. cetera. Um, and they did the research online on their um, in, in they did it individually actually took notes and then pulled that information with their partners and then created their own jigsaw. So Ooh. there is a reading component to that. There is a writing component to that. And then they also shared it um, in in their jigsaw reading with each other by presenting those pieces to each other. And actually, there's a listening component to that. <laughs> so it actually covers all skills. Yeah. Um, again that's not something that is easy to do and it really requires a lot of direction up front. So I often actually create this sort of instruction list that I reveal bit by bit so the students know what they're doing step by step. And I also really like telling them what the value of each step is. And I think knowing how their language skills are developing through each step really supports them in carrying that um, ability into the real world. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Great. Um, you also mentioned encouraging higher level students to volunteer. Do you have any tips on how to support that process? Um, well, at Mosaic, um, yes, <laughs> we have a volunteer program. So um, it's wonderful. We usually link our students with the volunteer program anytime. Well, we actually have a, um, a theme in our curriculum for volunteerism. So we do a lot of work with that. Um, one thing that we connect uh, them to as well is to, is to field trips, which is the, the one we do most is through Quest Food Exchange. And once students are there volunteering and they kind of see what it feels like to be out there supporting another organization and they hear about the great work that it does, it really ignites their 
desire to continue volunteering. So often from that, from just creating that opportunity for them to go out as a class, as a field trip to volunteer, they come back and, and ask for more opportunities. So we link them through our Mosaic um, volunteer outreach program. And um, sometimes students actually volunteer as a, a ESL assistants in our lower level classes as well. So Thanks. yeah, so yeah. if we see a really keen student, sometimes we offer them to do that as well. That's great. Yeah, some good tips. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we'll also have an opportunity to do a, a Q&A at the end of all the sessions. So please keep your questions coming in. So thanks again, Jen. I would uh, now like to introduce our next speaker, Anita Price, who is the coordinator and instructor for ESL and settlement assistance programs for Caribou Chilcotin Partners for Literacy. Anita has had a variety of careers, including insurance underwriter, high school teacher, fitness coach, business owner, and newspaper columnist. It's a variety of, uh, of, of jobs and careers, Anita. That's awesome. Currently, she is the coordinator at, um, at 100 Mile House for Char Caribou Chickleton Partners for Literacy. Anita is a literacy advocate volunteering with several organizations that promote literacy within the community. We are very lucky to have her with us today as she is soon to retire from her formal helping roles. Anita, thank you so much for your contributions to the community and we look forward to uh, picking your brain even after you leave. So I will now pass it over to Anita who is on the phone with us from 100 Mile House. Good morning and thank you very much. It's snowing here, so I'd rather be there, I think. Oh, <laughs> we feel your pain. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to do, to do this. As I am retiring, it's given me a good reflection on what I've done over the past several years with Caribou Chicote and Partners for Literacy. Next slide, please. 100 Mile is a small community about halfway between Vancouver and Prince George. Williams Lake is one hour drive north and Kamloops is a two hour drive southeast. The population of our community is about 1800, but we have a service area population of about 18,000. The contract for settlement services is held by Caribou Chilcotin Partners for Literacy, which is a nonprofit organization with three offices, two in Williams Lake and one in 100 Mile. The ESL and settlement services are provided through funding from IRCC and JTT. Partner assisted learning, financial literacy, group tutoring and other literacy programs are also offered to the communities through provincial funding, including the Community Adult Learning Program, also known as CALP. The ESL learners are encouraged to participate in those programs as well, either as learners or volunteer helpers. The Williams Lake Office offers linked classes, settlement assistance and have begun a conversation circle program. For eligible learners in 100 Mile, wanting the LINK program, they can be assessed in the Williams Lake office and then complete classes through LINK home study. The 100 mile conversation circles are held weekly on Tuesday mornings from September to May, usually for about one and a half to two hours. We meet at other times as well if there is a community event that is of value to the participants, or sometimes we just have a movie and pizza night to socialize. Although there is a core group of learners who attend every week, the conversation circles are drop-in, so we often have new attendees and guests. I use self-introductions and a focused question at the beginning of each meeting to quickly assess the language skills of newcomers and note improvements in self-confidence and language development in those who attend regularly. Ideally, the topic is introduced the week before the guest speaker or field trip is scheduled. We have a discussion, introduce new vocabulary associated with the topic, and make up the questions for our guests, which provides opportunities for me to assess the written and speaking skills of the learners. The questions are given in advance to the guests and all of our guests very generously donate their time. Guest speakers are chosen because of their relevance to the everyday lives of the learners and have included professionals such as a banker, a lawyer and a pharmacist. Several of the learners are small business owners and entrepreneurs, so guests have included successful local business owners and representatives from Community Futures, Service Canada and the Chamber of Commerce. Presentations from local organizations have encouraged the learners to develop their talents and broaden their scope of friends. Two of my learners now sing with the community choir. Another has become so adept at weaving that she, tell, that she sells her creations at craft fairs. I have several artists who have been able to show and sell their work at the art gallery, 
and the B&B owners have shown increase in their business since accessing the services of the Chamber of Commerce. There are lots of opportunities for assessment and for pictures to add to their portfolios. Next slide. We also go on field trips, which have included visits to the ambulance station, the fire hall, the grocery store, the high school, work BC, and the visitor information center. We also visit historic sites and go on nature walks so the learners become familiar with the birds, animals, and plants in their new community. We learn new sports like cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, and curling. Those who cannot participate in the activities are still encouraged to attend. I enlist the aid of a volunteer to sit with them while the others are active. The volunteer helps lead a conversation about the activity or another appropriate subject, so they are still practicing their conversation skills and benefiting from the meeting. During the field trips, the volunteers assist by providing additional explanations to any of the learners having difficulty understanding the new terms and concepts. Next slide. Meeting the speakers and visiting the locations takes the fear out of going somewhere new. I find going somewhere for the first time can be very intimidating, so I can only imagine how difficult it is for someone who doesn't speak English well. I can explain it's okay to go to the emergency room or the hospital if you don't feel well, but it can still be a very stressful experience to go there, especially if you're not feeling well. However, going to the hospital in the familiarity of the group and hearing from the staff that they are happy to help you takes the fear of the unknown away. Staff at the hospital walked us through the admitting procedure and explain the different areas of the hospital. Now when someone needs medical attention, they know how to access the services. Next slide. There is a lot of apprehension about the visit to the RCMP station. Many of the learners were really quite afraid of the police. The officers though were really friendly. We toured the facility, learned about getting a speeding ticket and saw the jail cells. A few weeks later, one of the learners had some items stolen from her home. She knew what to do. She contacted the RCP, RCMP and she had no difficulty or fear filing her claim and dealing with it. And it was because of her comfort level of now, of knowing the police in our community. Next slide, please. An important focus of the Conversation Circle program is to prepare learners to deal with situations new to them. And I did not know how important that would be when I invited Liz, who is the local director of, for the Provincial Emergency Support Services, to give a presentation to the group. She explained what would happen if there was an emergency in our area. She covered things such as how you would be notified, where you should go, the services that would be available to you, and where to get up-to-date information about the situation. At that point, we had no idea how important that information would be to all of us. Next slide. This summer, nearly every one of my learners and tutors were evacuated because of the wildfires. For some, it was a knock on their door and being told to leave immediately. I was so relieved to know that everyone had been prepared. Some ended up in cities they had never been to. Some traveled by bus with just one little suitcase. One ESL couple stayed with their tutor for the two weeks. Those who weren't evacuated were cut off from town and supplies by road closures and fires. At our first meeting after the fires, we sat in a circle and told of our experiences. It was quite amazing to see the confidence everyone had gained from being able to cope with such a difficult and stressful situation. There was noticeable improvement in everyone's language skills. And when given pen and paper, each one wrote several sentences detailing their adventures. Several spoke about how organized it was. Many were relieved that there was no panic like such a situation would have had in their home country. It was great to hear how they had relied on each other and their tutors, even if it was just communicating through texting and email. The outcomes surely could have been very different if they had not been prepared. The wildfire recovery agent was a guest at a conversation circle a few weeks ago. It was an opportunity for me to note the improvements made in their language skills as they again told of their experiences. They all had a great sense of validation when she promised changes to emergency services based on their input. Next slide. Two important potlucks are held during the year, before the Christmas holidays and before the summer break. It is a way for former students to remain connected and to meet new immigrants. Often they provide friendship and mentoring to newcomers as well as acting as translators if needed. Next slide, please. We also have a volunteer tutoring program which currently has 11 tutor learner matches. The tutors receive training and have criminal record checks. The hobbies, interests, and personalities of both the tutor 
and learner are carefully considered when making matches so they have things in common to converse about and a good basis for a friendship to develop. Other times a match is based mainly on what the learner needs and wants to learn, especially if it is job related. For example, I have a tutor who specializes in tutoring for medical terminology and another one who does university preparation. Most often the learners need a friend and someone to help them navigate in the community. So they go grocery shopping together, they go for a walk or participate in activities together. Some meet in the office if they want a formal tutoring session. One pair plays pickleball each week. A mom with her young children often goes for a walk with her tutor. The mom has help with her kids and has been introduced to all the parks and playgrounds in the area while learning English. Next slide. Each month, the tutors report who they tutored with, when they met, and for how long, so that it can be reported to IRCC and iCare and on the quarterly reports for JTT. They also give a brief report outlining the focus for the month and what improvements the learner has made or areas needing assistance. Usually it is anecdotal with comments like, we finally won a game of pickleball, or the daffodils we planted in the learner's garden are blooming. Bi-monthly, the tutors meet to share ideas and network together. New resources are introduced and some practical ideas for tutoring are discussed. The tutors find copies of the West Coast Reader are helpful, and I find great resources in the weekly emails from Dakota and the weekly settlement net updates from AMSA. Coworkers and tutors often share great resources they have found in the library. I keep notes about my observations whenever I meet with tutors and learners, which I then transfer to a spreadsheet on the computer to use when I am reporting to the funders. Next slide. None of our contracts for service require formal evaluations of the learners. However, I constantly monitor and note the learner's progress or identify areas of difficulty. The benefit of conversation style learning is that the stress sometimes caused by formal evaluation is gone, and instead evaluations are based on real life experiences which provide an accurate assessment of the integration of the learner into their new environment. The learner's level of engagement within the group and the community is monitored. Our ESL group in 100 Mile House is very diverse in their ages, home countries, and their socioeconomic status. But when they join the conversation circle, they are all equal in their desire to learn. All of them have a wealth of knowledge based on amazing life experiences. The Conversation Circle program in our rural area recognizes their need to be valued as accomplished adults while providing opportunities to evaluate their progress for the funders in non-conventional ways. Great, thank you so much, Anita. You've provided us with a, a wealth of perspective on language learning and community connections in a smaller center. So we thank you and we're very happy that technology was on our side. So we were able to hear from you directly. We, thank you. We do have a question for you. This is a question from a service uh, provider in a rural community. And this person says that I meet with my students once a week how might I support their learning with very little class time? That's where I find the tutors are really a great asset. My tutors meet with the learners at least weekly. Some of my tutors almost work, meet with the learners daily. Oh, okay. Okay, great. And Anita, you mentioned um, touring different locations such as the RCMP station. What are some mm -hmm. strategies that you use to support learners with lower level listening comprehension skills? The preparation we do in the week before really benefits them so that they're prepared with the vocabulary that they'll need. And I also try and have their tutor there so that they have someone right beside them to, to monitor the look on their faces when they don't understand something so they can right. explain it to them. Right. Okay. okay. I also prepare the speakers where we're going. I ask them to refrain from using idioms, to speak slowly, all of the things that help ESL learners. Okay, great. And then you talked about uh, the evacuation uh, during the wildfires. Can you let mm -hmm. us know what do you think um, most helped to prepare the learners for that evacuation? Was it more settlement support services or perhaps local news or word of mouth? What do you think was the most helpful? I think it was the support services support because team. they had been introduced to so many community members. When the first evacuation happened and we all went to an evacuation center, it was a lot of those community members that manned the evacuation center, so they saw familiar faces. 
they might not have known them, but they'd seen them around the community and had contact with them, so they were more comfortable. Right. And a lot of, of this is educating our community. It's really nice when you see a familiar face in the community. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. That definitely helps. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks, Anita. And um, we actually, this is a question for the Centre for Canadian Language Benchmarks. Uh, we have a couple of people who have, who have indicated that they are tuning in today. We do have a question for you. Uh, we were told that it was not advisable to combine more competency areas in one task. Would one aspect of, let's say, sharing information qualify as achievement of that competency area? We can come back to this question if we receive any comments from CCLB, but for those of you who are tuning in today from CCLB, please do let us know if you can answer that question for us, and we will share it out with the participants. And Anita, one, uh, one question maybe, I think we have a couple, a couple more questions for you. The next one is, uh, you mentioned that you start your circle off with a focus question. Could you give us a couple yeah. of examples of focus questions used to quickly assess and screen skills and confidence? Sure. Um, this past week, we had someone from an insurance agency come, okay. and he was a, our guest speaker, and the first question we asked was, do you have insurance? So as they went around and introduced themselves, we asked that question. One lady said yes. One, la one man said no, and one lady said, I don't believe in insurance. <laughs> Oh, no. So, so it depends on what they answer. So I make a quick note of their answers just on a paper beside me. You know, when they first come, they'll answer with a one-word question. Usually after about two months, they want to tell their whole life story in their introductions. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an easy way to monitor their progression, not just with language skills, but with their comfort level with being in the group as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, we actually have one additional question for CCLB. What is an appropriate ratio between anecdotal and assessment artifacts? So for those CCLB folks who are tuning in, if you could answer that for us too, that would be great and we will report it out. And uh, again, if you have questions for Anita, we will come back to it at the end of all presentations. So please use the GoToWebinar question box. You can use Twitter or you can email your questions to communications at amsa.org. Thank you again, Anita, for joining us. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Okay. I would now like to present and introduce our last speaker for today, April Toe. Uh, April is a link instructor at Success in Richmond and is also currently pursuing a master's in education from Simon Fraser University. Busy lady, April. Uh, April came highly recommended by the link community for her passion in helping newcomers reinvent their lives in Canada. I love that. Informally named English on the go, April's link outings are always thoughtfully planned to incorporate presentations by community-based speakers. These outings offer authentic learning experiences for adult learners and real-world task assessments are interwoven into the process. We are grateful she found a substitute instructor today to be able to share with us. And I would now like to pass it on to April To Welcome. Thank you, Farah, and thank you, Amazon, for this opportunity to be here in the webinar to share my passion. So, yes, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm just going to touch a little bit about who am I, what do I do, how do I do it. I think a big thing is about why or why, why do we do so many, why do we have field trips, and then maybe what's next. Uh, that's me. Uh, that photo was taken at a CBC field trip, uh, CBC tour. Okay, so I'm with Success, and I'm a Link 6 and 7 instructor. I like to call it English on the go, and I think the slight difference is I aim to have a guest speaker whenever I have a field trip, so it's a two-in-one. And so this is my mission and my vision to have real-world tasks in real-world settings with real-world people for real-world reasons. <laughs> nice. I hope that sounds nice. Okay. <laughs> 
because I need to invite guest speakers to be part of the learning experience while we are on a field trip. So it really does take time. So I would say I have to plan my field trips at least two, one to two, three months ahead in order to write to those contact community leaders and ask them if they could do the presentations. I came up with this acronym so that maybe something that you would like to remember. So if you have a field trip, plan ahead, PA, plan ahead and check. So they can do statements with the higher level students. In fact, they themselves can check and see, oh, what are the things we can do to fit into this field trip? And then as teachers, we check the profile ability benchmarks. And from there, we decide what is the best assess assessment that would make it a very successful field trip. So I'm just giving an example here of what we did last year. Um, started with me just sharing them some information. And then we did some reading on the world, uh, website. So the real world task was they had to navigate Vancouver's National Aboriginal Friendship Center's website to obtain important information. And then, of course, E is for enjoy. You've got to enjoy the field trips, for sure. <laughs> All right, so more ideas and suggestions uh, for those of you who are experienced link teachers, link instructors, nothing very new. Uh, so this is just a recap. You could do it as a self-assessment for the students. You could have a peer assessment, you could have teacher assessments. So this is just some ideas to bounce around. So before the field trip, so normally for success, we do have like three steps. Uh, what do we do before the field trip to prepare them? And then what do you do during the field trip? And, and after that, what is after the field trip? For me, the biggest part is during the field trip. We talk a lot about speaking one, listening one, uh, the competency of interacting with others. And it gets very real when the students are out there actually making the connections, talking to people out there in the community. So later on, I have some photos to show and you get what I mean. Okay, and the after is also another big part because they have gone out there, they've taken their photos, they've video recorded some of the experiences and when they get back to school, maybe the next day, maybe the next week, if you have a mixer with another class and they are, they are just so excited to share something that's truly authentic, very real, it's made a difference. So with the higher levels, what I normally do is that I would also ask them to follow up with a thank you letter to the presenter. And this is something that, so what I do is after they've written, I would scan all the letters without marking anything and send them to the speaker that I had during the field trip. And then with the, the original copies, I would mark. It becomes a writing one assessment. Again, nothing too new for those of you who are, have been doing Link for a long time. So just as something that was uh, what we did last year, the theme community. And the topic I wanted to touch on was National Indige Indigenous Peoples Day. Oh, I forgot the, <laughs> Never mind. Okay, CRB, Benchmark 7, Competency, Reading 3, Getting Things Done. And these are just some suggestions, uh, real world task. Um, I kind of summarized it to make it a little shorter. And tools, you can have your rubric, your checklist, um, the variety of tools that you can choose from. Okay. Again, nothing too new for those of you who have been doing Link for a while now. Um, these are just some ideas of what you could do, getting them to go to the website and then create a poster and maybe promoting that particular event to students from another class. This is what I am so proud of, um, of my students, proud of my students. So it started very simply as saying, okay, let's talk about integration. Let's talk about understanding where we live, our communities. And then we read, so there was skill building about reading about the Aboriginal communities. And then knowing that, okay, we have the National Aboriginal Day coming up. So we went to the website and they look at the details. And then some of them, so in this picture, the one above, six of us are from my class. We went one step, they went one step further. They said, we would love to volunteer. So they actually took it one step further. They emailed the coordinator. So there was a lot of uh, emails to and fro, which I think is very authentic. They had to read, they had to understand, they had to fill out the volunteer forms. Uh, and there was another round before that we went, uh, we had our training and some of them took part in the friendship day. This was last year, it was really awesome. So can't get more real than that. All right. Oh yes. Can you guess who's that? That's Mayor Gregor Robinson. <laughs> um, yeah, so he, he was very kind. He spent about almost 10 to 15 minutes just chatting with us. And I was thinking, okay, this is awesome. This is like speaking one, interacting with others. And, and uh, we, we did the canoe as well. 
So listening to the instructions on how to canoe, that was also very authentic. Volunteers were given free first aid training. So we were out there being part of the community. And to me, this is what, this is what integration looks like. This is last year. Okay, another awesome field trip that we had a lot of fun at. So first we did reading again, reading for information, uh, finding out what is, what is Canada 150 about, and then building up what are different cities doing to celebrate Canada 150. And because I'm from Richmond, so the city of Richmond is very vibrant, lots of activities. And we, we had King of the Sea coming in, one of the biggest ships in the world. And so we said, okay, let's do this field trip. Because these are link seven and eight, we could actually discuss. So a lot of social interaction, say what would we like to do? What kind of field trips would we like to have? So we decided to go to welcome the ship. And while we were there, we saw the mayor. So again, we went out, we talked to the mayor. I said, Mayor, would you like to take a photo with us? And mayor said, why not? <laughs> and there we are. Um, and of course, the best part was after that, we had a speaking for sharing information assessments. And it was very real because by now they had the photos, they could describe the ship, they could say what the event was about. So totally real in that sense. Uh, okay, so this was one month after we met the mayor. We said, Mayor, we met you, remember? Could we see you again? And it happened. So I think part of the link teacher's role is sometimes just making the connections, keeping those contacts, and then one door leads to another door. So in this particular picture, in fact, the mayor himself, he gave them a presentation for close to half an hour, explaining how the city is run at a municipal level. So that was very real. So it's a field trip plus presentation, two in one. This was more recent. So with the link at seven and eight, we were talking about business employment. So again, I reached out to my contacts. So again, I have to say, all these contacts have to be built. It's not an overnight thing. I built up the contacts with the community people over years and to maintain the contacts. And then to two months before that to say, hey, you know, Gary, would you mind helping to present again? And he agreed because the previous year, students had also written to thank him. So once again, this presentation was done, the field trip was awesome, and then students got to write an email to thank Gary. So my presentation is actually pretty short. It's coming to an end, and I'm just asking myself that when we talk about success for a newcomer, when they're reinventing their lives, what does it look like? What is success for everybody? I think for me, it looks like everybody. It doesn't matter whether you are local, you are new immigrants, old immigrants, everybody is there meeting and interweaving their strengths, passions, dreams, goals, life experiences, everything into this very colorful tapestry that I call home, Canada. And that's it from me, Senator <laughs> Rose. If you want to get in touch with me um, for more contact numbers or whatever, uh, you could reach me at april.to at success.bc.ca. Great. Thank you so much, April. I love your energy and your passion. And thank you for sharing that with us. It sounds like you had some wonderful trips and uh, some really educational ones as well. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, if you have any questions for April or for any of our presenters, please feel free to use the GoToWebinar question box, Twitter, or you can email your questions to communications at amsa.org. And um, April, we do have a couple of questions for you. Okay. How do you organize your outings when clients do not have bus tickets or means of transportation? Okay, so we are in Richmond and we have the Canada Line. Ah, yes. So Canada, Canada Line is very accessible, so it's pretty convenient. So in that sense, sometimes it's around there and like um, sometimes I have my outings that's within the city of Richmond where my students are based. So it doesn't pose that great a problem. Right. And when we do have to go a little further, sometimes a few of them would offer to carpool. Oh, okay. And, and it works out. Right. So fire has worked out. Great. If, it, if it really poses a huge problem, then no. So because it is always a collective, a group, a class agreement to say, let's do this. Right. Yes. Okay. No, thank you. Um, how might you facilitate outings if you were teaching a night class? Oh, there was once I actually got in touch with someone from Value Village 
the, the one at Victoria. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I would go in advance, I would say, I have a night class, you know, we are, we are talking about um, recycling, about the environment. And what I've discovered through this whole process of being a link instructor is that people love to help. Yeah. People love to help. They want to help. And when they know that we have newcomers who want to integrate, to learn more, they say, okay, come. So we, I was very lucky. So again, uh, the supervisor there uh, arranged for one of the staff to do a tour and to explain the process. Oh, so great. that was done. Yeah. The libraries are also a good place. Yep. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I, I know it's going to be a little limited for evening teachers. Yeah. But there are still options here and there. Whole Foods is another awesome one. Ah, Whole Foods. Yes. Whole yeah, Foods. there's lots yes. to do in there. Yes. <laughs> great. Thank you. Um, we asked this to Anita, but our audience would also like to hear from Jennifer as well as April on this. Do you have any tips to support learning when you're only meeting once a week? I, I think that what Anita said was really important and that if it's possible to have tutors. However, we don't do that kind of link at Mosaic. Um, so I really think that um, keeping things student centered as much as possible and, and being in a more facilitator role is always helpful. Um, yeah, I think that that really helps with that kind of connection. And again, if we can connect students with other programs where they can um, use their English, we have conversation circles at mm -hmm. Mosaic. Right. Um, there's lots of different um, groups that have outings like, um, through settlement services. We have workshops. So we always really promote as many possible um, connections as, they, as we can for the students. And students actually really are, um, excited to join different groups and different workshops to learn things. Right, right. So that facilitates that. Okay, thank you. April, any thoughts? With the higher levels, it's easier. You could ask them, you know, get them excited about going to Toastmasters, or now we have Meetup, Meetup. Right. Lots of exciting activities. Yeah. So that was one of the lessons. So we got them to see, you know, to go to Meetup and check how to register, what are things you're interested in. Yeah. And some of them have joined. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so we had asked the Centre for Canadian Language Benchmarks about comp uh, combining competencies in one task, and we do have an answer from them. They say that while it is possible to com combine competencies, there needs to be enough of the competency within the task to properly assess it. So in the parent-teacher example, the social interaction part is usually going to be very brief, small talk which really isn't enough to assess. It would be more realistic if the social interaction was perhaps small talk with other parents while waiting for the parent-teacher interview. So hopefully that makes sense. And um, yeah. And another response from CCLB is that anecdotal comments would be in addition to the combination of skill using activities and assessment tasks. And I believe there's a link that we will send to people, Julie. Okay. Yeah, the, um, the advice is to consult the PBLA Emerging Practice Guidelines okay. and to take a look at the section again on um, Part B, com Portfolio Contents where you'll find some more information on the uh, artifacts um, and what can be included in combination as a combination to, to create those, those artifacts. Great. And where the balance, where the balance can lie as well in formal notes and anecdotal comments or checklists that have been collected over the semester to document what a learner can do um, aside from re regular classroom activities is, is, mentioned in there as well. May, may I just make a quick little comment? So I'm just thinking about that, um, the combining of competencies part and about the social interaction. And I, and I just really feel that, in fact, interacting with others is a huge social skill that's used in many, many arenas. And for that parent-teacher interview for interacting with others, there would be maintaining and opening and closing conversations. Um, adding comments, explaining, taking turns interrupting appropriately, um, showing comprehension by asking clarification questions. I think all that's really valid and, and that's actually transferable to a lot of things that students need to do in the real world. So, um, so I feel that if there is enough criteria from both competency areas, it actually 
is quite valid if we're talking about um, language use in the real world. Mm. Okay, great, thank you. And so this next question is for, for everybody. What are your thoughts on how real world or uh, not having a guest speaker can be for the learners? Real world tasks, right? Sorry. Yeah, that was so, um, how real world or not is it uh, to okay. have a guest speaker come into the classroom? Because um, sometimes the guest speakers may not always be prepped, like in Anita's case, where, where she communicates when, with them. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Having guest speakers as real world tasks that help support building the artifacts. And Anita, please feel free to answer as well. April, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it's very real world in that, um, you know, earlier I mentioned just us as individuals going out to different presentations in the community and receiving information. So it, it's, it's just where it's happening for me that's changed. So instead of the class going to the presenter, the presenter is just coming to us. It just facilitates learning because we're in a classroom and that's it sometimes as real world as it can get. So I think it's very valid. Okay. April, any other thoughts? Yeah, I agree that? with what Jen said. So sometimes, because the reality is there are constraints. Yeah. So we have to work around the constraints. Right. So we've had a fireman coming to our school, a policeman coming to our school, oh. a BC Hydro coming to the school. Right. So it's pretty much very real world. So yes. like BC Hydro, they would actually bring everything with them, ah. some of the stuff, so the students get hands on as well. Right. Yeah. Great. I think the only aspect that's not real world is when the teacher or the presenters do have to modify their language because mm. again we do the same thing where we give you know as administrators we give a list of um, you know what to do when speaking to, to people with English as their second language um, so they are modifying their language but again we're making that we're giving them those steps to get there where eventually they can go out and listen to their own presentation yeah. by helping to modify that language. Great. Anita any thoughts from you on the phone? Um, it's very real world in preparing them, just like when we had the emergency services person come into our our classroom and teach us about what would happen, and then it actually did happen. It became very real. It might not have felt real in the classroom, but that preparation was so important for what really did happen. Right. Um, we do have time for some more questions, and so this is another one for all of you. What is the protocol for your organizations to take students out of the classroom? So with success, we do have to seek approval. So normally the first step is um, at the start of the month, we do the learner's needs analysis, and then we, as a class, we may discuss and figure out what is good, you know, what would we like to do for field trips. And I would have to, I do two things simultaneously. So I have to start to reach out to my contacts, especially if I said I've already, I need to write to them two months ahead. So at the same time, I would let my supervisor know that this is what I'm planning ahead. Uh, could you give me the green light? So if my supervisor said yes, and Elise has been super supportive all these years, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and then the next step is we do have to put into a system, we use the wiki space to upload to say that this is what we're planning to do. What, what are we doing before the field trip, during the field trip, and then after the field trip? So that the management has a clear idea of what is the whole purpose? Is it relevant? Is it gonna be meaningful? So yes. Okay, okay, thanks. How about you, Jen? Um, so for our teachers, we, the IDs, the instructional developers, actually actively look out for guest speakers and field trips for our classes to go on. Um, of course, teachers do request different field trips as well. And we just ask, you know, is it pedagogically sound? Like, is there a language-based reason you're going out? And we're pretty old school. We just get them to fill out a form <laughs> by hand um, and submit that. And then we get them their bus tickets. The only concern we have is that we have a childcare as well. So yeah. we just have to make sure that um, the childcare is informed, you know, all the contact information is available in case, you know, the students are coming back late or something. We don't want any crying children. Um, so there is those things, things to think about. Um, one of our sites has a, has a not a, a licensed childcare, but a, I think it's more of a daycare. So with that instance, it's harder for the parents mm -hmm. because they can only be 50, 
like 50 feet away from their okay. children. So, okay. so, are, so there are some limitations sometimes in those ways. Okay. But, but yes. Great. Thanks. Anita, how about you? Anything that you wanted to add? No, there's there's great benefits to being in rural BC. We don't have too many rules. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. As long as it's safe, we go. We <laughs> tend not to go in the winter when the roads are bad, though. Right, yes. Um, okay, this is another question for all of you. So uh, Jen spoke about how she uses anecdotal evidence. Uh, in your practice, in what other ways do you collect or use anecdotal evidence uh, to provide feedback to your learners on their language progress? Who would like to go first? <laughs> Um, well, I, well, I think I already mentioned that um, quite a bit um, okay. with with the section that I talked about for anecdotal evidence. So I would just say that, um, yeah, we just we document what we hear from the students and what we see happening in the class. Of course, if it's based on the task, we don't need to document that as something extra. But if it's just something on the fly that happens that we notice and we think, oh my God, that's amazing! That student has really progressed in this particular competency area then we document that um, and we're, we're, I mean, we're trying to get there. We're, we're doing that more because, because we think that's another way to manage the gathering of that number of tasks, um, but also because we see it as real world evidence. Right. Okay. I agree. Great. Very much agree. Okay. <laughs> Anita, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I, I email a lot. My, most of my learners have email. Not all of them do because in rural BC, not everyone has access to internet. But I email them a lot. So if I've seen something really great, I email them a little, yay who, yeah, who you did this, or great work on this, or wow, I noticed an improvement here. And just that little bit of encouragement. I also have one of my learners who loves to take photographs. So she takes photographs of lots of the students doing lots of things and she'll send me the photograph. So I'll often forward a photograph of them with a big smile on their face as they do something and oh. they feel that sense of accomplishment. That's great. Okay, so here's the last question that we have. Um, you know, uh, and, and please feel free to, to jump in as well. But Anita, in your case, you mentioned that you monitor and note the learner's progress or identify areas of difficulty. How often do you provide written feedback on progress for those in your circles? Written feedback to the students themselves, to the learners? Yes. Probably frequently, but it's probably done after class via email. Ah, okay. Okay, that's good to know. And did you want to say anything about that, Jen or April? Sure. Well, um, we do provide action-oriented feedback for more um, of the formal sort of teacher-directed assessment. So definitely it, it happens quite frequently, and um, it takes a lot of thought to, to really um, be action-oriented. So I think that in itself is a skill that, that, is, um, that teachers are developing too, is, is the not, oh, that's a great job, but, um, you know, you really understood that vocabulary in context, great yeah. work, or, you know, um, or some other suggestion where they could improve. So, um, yeah, we definitely do that through action-oriented feedback, and we do that through written form and also verbally, absolutely, all the time. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, what we do is, for example, writing to the presenters to thank them. Uh, after they have written, the students have written their letters, I make copies, and then we read each other's letters. And then from there, they are learning, okay, this is a better way to phrase it. This is a better way to express appreciation. And I would just pick up the really good ones and use those as a way of telling the rest that, you know, this is this is how to improve. Yeah. yeah that's one way that I do. Yeah, and I, I just want to add that I think that's amazing. Like the yeah. peer feedback is yes. incredibly helpful. So sometimes before writing a formal email, formal in quotes, like it could be for social interaction or something like that, but um, I'll get students to have a scenario and they'll write it in groups on big paper just to work with the formatting of an email, the language conventions, and then we put them up and have a look at them as groups. We'll just tour the <laughs> different emails, the big emails, and in that way we give each other that constructive feedback and learn from each other as well. Yeah, so I think yeah. um, as what April said is fantastic, that peer feedback is so valuable. Right, yes. yeah, no, definitely. Okay, so are there any final motivational comments from all of you on uh, bridging the classroom space to the real world? Is there anything that you'd like to leave us with today? Um, I, I just like to say that I think that 
it's it's been a difficult switch um, from the way we were formally teaching to moving towards PBLA. And I, I think it's hard. It's hard work for instructors. It's hard work for the administration. Um, as much support as we can get from the higher ups would be appreciated. Um, but just uh, I just want to acknowledge that it, it is great work. I do see a difference in my classroom uh, by using task based teaching. And there's just so much more involvement with the reflection component. Students are just way more engaged and it's amazing. Like I just I love seeing the growth in my students and just all the amazing work they're doing. So yes. Thanks, Jen. So have fun with it, but yeah, yeah. It, it's great, yeah. <laughs> but it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember a quote from the little prince that you have to put up with the caterpillars in order to befriend or get acquainted with the butterflies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice one. I love, I, love, I love the little prince. Yeah. yeah. So when I get a little bogged down, I, I read that quote. Yeah. So here comes a caterpillar. <laughs> it's going to be a butterfly. That's awesome. <laughs> Anita, any last words you'd like to leave us with? I, I think it was said earlier, have fun. My students, I think, learn more because we have fun and it's a fun environment. And I think that's what this does is it makes learning fun. Great. Well, thank you all of you for participating in that Q&A. Uh, if uh, those of you listening, for any questions that we may not have been able to answer as they're related to PBLA and assessment, please consult the web resource PBLA Emerging Practice Guidelines 2017. This resource, resource incorporates new information and relevant content from CCLB updates and handouts. So again, thank you for joining us today on International Women's Day and for sending in all your great questions. We hope you leave us today with a new toolkit of knowledge and ideas on bridging language learning assessment with the real world. A special thank you to our speakers for giving us their time and sharing of their experience to help support the settlement language sector. Thank you to the AMSA team, Julie, Khan, and Melissa, who is on tech support for all of your background efforts. And uh, to, there's a lot that goes into planning these webinars. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to our speakers, Jennifer Lowe, Anita Price, and April To. April to Lastly, we'd like to thank Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada for funding this event today. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.